I just wanted to give a quick recap um, since we just started recording. So um, what I was talking about prior to the slide was this idea of um, current models of healthcare being very centralized and how that creates um, a lack of access to people that are on the margins of that healthcare system and how in the um, in this period of COVID-19, uh, countries like the US and perhaps others are reimagining healthcare, particularly um, with the uh, inclusion of telemedicine, um, and as well as uh, thinking about um, having an, uh, an additional cohort of health workers who can help uh, disseminate care when there are limited resources. And then I tied that to cervical cancer um, because there are many things in common, I think, between COVID-19 and cervical cancer. Uh, for one, uh, it's a virus. Um, and two, uh, vaccination is available, but it's not accessible. And so even when a vaccination is available, you know, 300,000 or more women die every year, um, largely because, uh, you know, vaccination doesn't work for them, they already have the virus. And second, um, many do not even have access to vaccines because of the shortage in supply and the importance for screening and diagnosis being uh, and treatment being um, an important way to prevent cervical cancer in the next generation of, of women before the vaccine can actually have an impact. And the other thing that's, in, that's common between the two is that cervical cancer prevention really requires women-centered care. And I think in an era where we're thinking about telemedicine, we also need to think about innovations in medical devices that will allow patients to uh, do the test at home as a way to do things that were traditionally done in hospitals and clinics. And I think that's ripe for innovation. And um, my story on cervical cancer prevention uh, tries to exemplify that. And so um, in cervical cancer prevention, there are three steps, screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And now self-HPV testing is actually uh, something that's being used more and more for uh, screening for the virus, and that can be done at home. And now there's an ablative technology called the thermocoagulator, which is several thousand dollars, but can be re reused a number of uh, many times and um, can be used in the point of care setting. So the what's in the middle is diagnostics. And we thought about focusing our efforts uh, on that technology. How can we create diagnostics that would lend itself to community-based um, implementation and also home-based implementation and reduce the traditional three visits uh, a woman has to make into one visit ideally in a community setting, in a health center near her home. So um, I was talking about the colposcope, uh, which is used to look at the cervix. Um, it requires the use of a speculum to provide a clear line of sight to the cervix. And uh, the technology uh, is fairly expensive, and it, you know, basically from five to $15,000, simply because of the fact that it is so far away from the cervix, about a foot, and that really drives up the cost. And um, this is also a reminder of what I call sustaining innovation, which is you have one innovation that exists, the speculum, which was developed 200 years ago, and then you have something else that comes sort of on top of it, and it's a layered sort of innovation versus just thinking about the problem from a completely new mindset and one where um, you might say, well, what if... I had to sort of start over with the current uh, access to technology. How might I reinvent this technology to make it cheaper and more accessible in the community health setting? And the idea that we had was instead of having a colposcope that is this upright device that looks through the uh, um, looks from outside. Uh, the reproductive tract, could you actually develop something that looks like a tampon and uh, put it on the end of that tampon where the camera and the light source can take a picture and a smartphone could allow you to both look at that uh, video or picture and um, use uh, uh, AI or other machine learning algorithms to um, render a decision. Now my battery's running low, so let me move back to the other um, place where um, my internet connection is not so great, but maybe we can move that soon. Um, so the, we were inspired by um, the design of the spy pen, 
which essentially is um, a pen that has a camera and um, uses obviously ambient light to take a picture. And we thought, what if we could use the same kind of idea with consumer technology to develop a colposcope that can take pictures um, as good as um, a uh, traditional um, colposcope? And so that um, was what essentially led to the design of the pocket colposcope, which essentially has a, a camera and a light source at the tip, a hydrophobic window, so it can be used in humid areas. And uh, because of some of the innovations on the tip, we were able to get images uh, just like you can with a high-end colposcope. And also high-end colposcopes allow you to see both green and white images, white being just white light images and green being images that look at the vasculature. Uh, the white light allows you to look at um, acetic acid stained images, which uh, highlight uh, diseased areas as sort of an opaque white, whereas the green light allows you to see vasculature, which arises as a result of um, severe dysplasia. And so here are some representative images from a traditional colposcope and the pocket colposcope and the lesion that um, is uh, precancerous is on the top and you can see this opacity, this white opacity. And you can see that with both images and uh, we've done a very large study on concordance and basically the conclusions that a provider would make with either of the technologies is essentially the same. But what's even better is that you can use machine learning algorithms and we have uh, done this um, with our images and shown that the algorithms can perform more consistently than uh, physicians and the performance of these algorithms are superior to that of expert uh, physicians. So you could both um, move the technology and the expert out of the hospital to the community and um, Basically, that would allow us to bring healthcare uh, that is normally provided in a specialty clinic to the community setting. Now, I mentioned that in addition to this community based care, we could actually bring screening and diagnosis to a woman's home. So, I wanted to set the precedent for that. Um, I have a um, collaborator in Peru called Patty Garcia. And she has created a social franchise model where she um, basically recruits housewives from uh, rural communities, um, low resource communities, and has, has them basically serve as entrepreneurs who go around and educate women in their communities, as well as disseminate uh, HPV self-testing kits. And the idea is that um, they give the tutorial using this didactic bag, they give the test, um, it costs the woman who's taking the test less than it would cost to get a bus ride uh, to a screening facility. And then once she completes the test, she drops it off in a repository and then it's processed from the central facility and then she gets a text, text message of the result. And we thought, what if we could do the same thing with the colposcope? What if we could actually have the pocket colposcope serve as a uh, see and treat device? So it diagnoses, it, it basically provides a uh, decision, the absence of an expert, so that um, instead of a biopsy, you could actually treat the woman at that visit. So that's the single visit. But what if you could even develop a colposcope that a woman can use to image herself in a screening setting, and then use that to determine which women even need to come in for uh, colposcopy and treatment? That way, you would essentially move two out of the three steps into a woman's home. So with this model in place, we thought, can we develop a technology that can essentially image the cervix and can be used by uh, the woman to see her own cervix, take a picture, which can then be processed centrally, either through an expert or through a virtual um, expert um, and provide a decision so that only women that are HPV positive and coloscope positive would end up in a health facility. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this coloscope. Um, you might recall that I mentioned the speculum. And the speculum is a device that essentially allows a provider to um, insert this into the reproductive tract. And then uh, it has these ductiles that are closed, but then that, that can be opened apart to essentially get a light into the service. Also um, allow um, provider 
to essentially insert the device, they uh, do not have to do imaging outside of the cervix, which can get very expensive. But then we asked our questions, uh, asked a question whether we could even get rid of the speculum altogether, particularly for a home test. Uh, keep in mind that the HPV task done at home does not require a speculum. So could we do the same with a pocket colposcope, essentially, that does not require um, a speculum? And so um, I'm just going to sort of get right to the technology. But to make a long story short, what we did is instead of using a speculum, we thought about new ways of making the procedure user-friendly and comfortable because the speculum-based exam is really not that comfortable. And um, what we did is we knew that we had essentially a, uh, a slender light source and camera and we thought, what if you could essentially design something that looks like a kala lily? The, the pocket colposcope could essentially sort of represent the stem of the kala lily and the shape of the petal becomes very important because the cervix often tilts away from the line of sight and so the blades of the speculum allow the provider to push it into place so that you can then see it and get a picture but instead of using the blades of a speculum we thought if we have an asymmetric tip like you can see in a kala lily when you put it in uh, through the vaginal canal, it will automatically, through this asymmetry, sort of flip uh, or, or reorient the cervix that's facing away into the line of sight. And I have to say that this was not a trivial task. I mean, getting that cervix to align um, through, uh, you know, basically align so that you can see it uh, from, um, through the canal is actually quite a challenging task. And so this took quite a bit of time to optimize and also to design something that would stand uh, the vaginal forces that um, essentially make the walls collapse around the cervix. And so this is the coloscope. Essentially, it has the same technology as the pocket colposcope, but instead of the speculum, there's an inserter. And that inser inserter is what allows the speculum to essentially be replaced by this color-like uh, tip that allows for visualization of the cervix. Um, so this is the coloscope, and you can see the camera here, and then this is this asymmetric tip that becomes very important in the operation of this technology. It's connected to a, um, a phone or a tablet so that you can actually see uh, in real time, a video or a picture of the cervix. So I'm going to show you um, a video of a woman inserting the coloscope and finding her cervix and then um, taking a picture of it. And so you can see that the coloscope is going through the reproductive tract. And then you can see the cervical os, which essentially is an opening into the uterus. And what she's trying to do is essentially twist, um, turn the uh, um, coloscope until the os is central to the picture. Basically, you can see around it. And that's the region where um, cervical cancer arises. So this is an image of, uh, again, the cervix obtained with the traditional colposcope and the coloscope camera. And you can again see that uh, there is this sort of opaque white area, especially on the right, um, sort of between the, 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 the vascular area. And that is the precancerous area. And I think, I personally think that in some ways you can see it more clearly than on the left-hand side, but I think an expert would be able to, again, draw the same conclusions from both of these devices. Now, the next um, graph that I'm showing you is a slightly you know, dense, so I'm gonna walk you through it. We've done studies both in the US and Ghana, and also both a clinical exam and a self-exam, just to show that um, you can do both. And so it can be used in a clinic if for, for a self-exam, a woman could do this privately or a provider can do it. And it can also be used as a self-exam in the home setting. So for the clinical exam, we looked at the visualization score and how much of the cervix can you see. And while the coloscope in its current form is slightly worse than a regular speculum, um, that is easily remedied by making uh, the um, 
the kala lily tip a little bit wider and um, also um, just increasing the length of the kala lily uh, stem because sometimes uh, the, the vaginal canal is longer than that stem. Um, on the right hand side is the pain scale and suffice it to say uh, in a clinical exam women prefer the coloscope over the um, speculum based exam. On the bottom, what you see is um, levels of discomfort uh, for um, basically an ease of use for the coloscope uh, during a self-exam and essentially the, um, the light and sort of dark grays correspond to extremely very and slightly easy. And you can see that um, whether it pertains to uh, ease of use um, on the left and the comfort on the right, uh, in both Ghana and in the US, women largely thought it was extremely easy to um, slightly easy. So what's our vision? Our vision is to essentially combine self-HPV testing with self-imaging so that we can dramatically increase coverage of cervical cancer screening because essentially what we're saying is we're going to put the tools in the hands of women and then we're going to connect them with providers or an algorithm that allows rapid decision making without the need for a woman to take eight bus rides into the city, which is often the case when you're living outside of Lima. And that can take a full day when uh, these women have uh, multiple um, obligations. So I just wanna conclude by saying that um, there are barriers that we've identified um, in the context of cervical cancer screening. Uh, one is, um, you know, um, structural, the others are educational, the third is cultural, there might be others, but these are the ones we've identified. In Peru, only 30% of women show up for screening. In fact, I forgot to mention that um, with the self-HPV testing that's done by my collaborator, Patty Garcia in Peru, two thirds of the women who actually did the self-HPV test um, had never been screened before, even though screening is free in Peru. And the second thing that I want to point out is that um, 50 women out of the 2000 had disease that needed to be treated. So had they not had the HPV test, they probably would have gone on to get cancer. And uh, what's even more abysmal is that of the 30%, only 25% who actually get screened, get confirmatory diagnosis and treatment, which means that in addition to having the HPV test and the coloscope in the, in the home setting, we also need the pocket colposcope with a thermocoagulator that I mentioned in a health center near a woman's home so that doesn't become a barrier to completing care. And so um, we essentially want to create bridges that will reduce the number of visits that a woman has to make and can ideally get those, um, the care she needs by uh, in the community and through people that she can uh, relate to. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we have uh, implemented different uh, elements of this uh, technology in different countries. And now we're sort of coming together under the auspices of the WISH model, Women Inspired Strategies for Health, to bring all these pieces together with another element that I didn't talk about, which is storytelling, because you know, the oral tradition of storytelling is how people communicate with each other. Of course, now we do it on other through other media, but you know, women hearing from other women about their experiences um, can really uh, create a multiplier effect. And so we wanna bring the social uh, element into our wish model. And what's really nice about that is it's a way to socially connect too at this time of physical distancing. And there's no better way to do it than with digital technology. So I think it also paves the way of new ways of communication for for people that are um, historically used to oral forms of communication in person, but now have to resort to other ways of communicating uh, with each other. So um, actually, uh, as I said, my slides got mixed up, but um, I just wanted to add one more thing um, to, to this piece, which is that, as I mentioned, innovation is key, 
Um, and innovation doesn't have to be just technology, but that's what we do. And I think that another element of this entire program is student engagement, because students are the ones that are thinking about this technology and bringing that to the forefront. It's a really great way to empower students to have real life experiences working on things that could have real impact. And, um, you know, I just would like to, you know, close by saying, you know, innovations can help to uh, optimize operational efficiency, but they can also improve to clinical prediction and care in ways that we may not be able to do currently, but could be the solution for tomorrow. And I think that, um, you know, while the circumstances under which um, speaking about this are dire and certainly one that I would never wish for, um, I do think that the silver lining is that we can all think about how um, we need to think of, um, you know, bold and innovative solutions to tackle the realities of post-COVID and, and what that's going to do uh, for healthcare systems that are really um, um, sort of depleted given uh, what needs to be done now um, acutely. And hopefully when the next crisis un uh, unfolds, we will be in a position where um, we can do far better because of the innovations that come out of this um, uh, precarious time. So um, that's the end of my talk and I'm glad to answer questions, although I realize that we're well over uh, or a lot of time, but I'm happy to stick around and uh, answer questions uh, if needed. So, um, if you have a question, um, yeah. if you are able to unmute yourself, please, uh, please go ahead. I'm just going to stop sharing. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for that presentation. Um, oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah. Did I, I think I didn't even like show my video. Oh my God. I just realized. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. Hi, name is me, Karthikeyan. I just uh, learned a lot. Thanks for the presentation. I have just a quick question, like one uh, basically regarding this uh, HPV. I was under the impression that uh, cancer generally comes due to like unhealthy consumption or behavioral patterns, but this is the first time I'm hearing cancer because of a virus. I want to know, is there any other types of uh, cancer that is uh, due to a virus? And also like uh, HPV is just one of the factors or there are other uh, factors for the cervical cancer? Yeah, let me talk about cervical cancer first. I mean, I think it's a very unusual cancer. First of all, because it's caused by a virus. And second of all, because it's caused by a virus, it's probably the one cancer that can have a preventative vaccine um, mitigated altogether. So that is pretty special about cervical cancer, which is why the number of deaths that occur every year is unacceptable. Are there other factors that contribute? Of course, there are comorbidities. So if you're a person with HIV, uh, that makes you more susceptible to this virus. So there are things that can um, affect it more. And obviously, because it's transmitted uh, largely through sex, um, sexual practices and, and protection can also um, affect a lack of protection can also affect um, transmission of the virus. So you could almost think of it as a cross between, you know, like a sexually transmitted disease and a cancer. So it actually falls in both camps. Um, are there other cancers uh, similar to this? I am personally not aware. Uh, there are cancers for which therapeutic vaccines are being developed, but I'm not aware of any cancers for which there is a preventative vaccine. Um, and so I think that makes cervical cancer um, pretty uh, unique. Thank you. And, uh, just uh, one more question regarding the business uh, aspects of the product. Like, uh, I understand this is like a very impactful in the sense that it's bringing like opening the eyes of women towards the product. But what I'm looking for is this is something that's going to reduce the number of visits to the hospital. From the patient's point of view, it is something that is like uh, really wonderful. But looking at from the clinic's point of view, isn't it going to reduce their cost? Because like uh, during one of my uh, consulting projects, I worked with a company that was developing like a plastic uh, cast for the fractures. It is basically like reducing 
uh, the current process for fracture is they have the splint that is placed initially and then uh, the plaster of Paris that goes with and then the removing. So a patient visits like four to five times for removing the fracture. Uh, and uh, with the plastic cast, it's uh, like completely removed the entire number of visits. So I'm seeing a parallel between that and this one. Uh, when this is happening, like how will the clinics react? Because like doctors are the ones who are eventually going to give this product and recommend it to the patients. If they are going to see something that's affecting their revenue, how are you going to promote this? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, such an important question, right? This is all about incentives, you know. Uh, Partly, I would say this is why um, certain people don't have access to healthcare because the incentives are not aligned. And if there is money to be made from a certain procedure, it's hard to give it up. I mean, it's just the reality. And so how do you align incentives? I mean, this happens not just in this particular case, but in fact, I'll give you another example, um, just in addition to the one you gave, which is probably uh, even more of a, of a potential um, cost issue, which is, you know, if you come in for surgery, say for removing a breast tumor and you want to get clear margins, uh, you would think the idea would be to not have the patient come back from multiple surgeries. And I don't think anyone wishes for that. But if you look at the reimbursement process, you get the full amount for the first surgery and a portion of that amount for the second and the third, which means that there's no reason to get it right the first time, even though I don't believe anybody would necessarily do that purposely, but, but the system isn't necessarily um, rewarding a uh, single visit. And so you can argue that for this particular case, and that is the reality in some of the countries we work in, that uh, there is a threat to um, normal professional services, healthcare services, when we're trying to upend a traditional model. And uh, nobody said that disruptive innovation wouldn't be, you know, would be easy. And so I think we have to all recognize that, but not be afraid to move forward. But that brings me back to this current um, environment, which is, think about this, right? Let's say that, you know, everything at steady state allows you to care for everyone. That is not true anyway, but let's just say that's the case. Now, when you have this crisis and you're dealing with essentially shortages, and then you think about essentially uh, restabilizing other types of care, whether it's for cancer or diabetes or whatever it might be, you no longer can rely on the on the on the current resources as it is and the healthcare systems and the insurers can't pay for everything the way they used to so i think there is already a move towards in the us towards health based uh, compensation right value based care um, some of the uh, insurers are already doing it uh, like kaiser but it's not you know uniform across but i think it again it takes something i think like this um, for us to sort of see the stark reality of where our system is weak. Um, we see that we're low on ventilators and some of our health facilities in various parts of the country are not equipped for this high volume of patients. So I think it's like this pressure test that tells you where the, 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 the weakest links are in your system. And I think it takes this kind of um, emergency, this crisis for us to sort of reassess what we have. So I'm hoping that it's a mix of um, wanting for insurers to see and, 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 the, and the powers that be to see that payment reforms are made to prioritize not fee for service, but value based care, but simultaneously for the healthcare community to see that business as usual may not be sustainable because there's no saying that this crisis is going to end. It could be seasonal. And there's no saying that we wouldn't have another virus um, epidemic or pandemic that would confront us, say, in the foreseeable future. So, how do we plan for this new reality in the long term? So I think the answer is long-winded, but I think it's 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 also uh, one that considers that there are various factors. And I also think the third thing is young people, right? I mean, you can't change uh, things that as they are, especially because there's a lot of inertia. But if the next generation of innovators and healthcare providers see this, they see this crisis unfold, uh, they might think differently about how the future should be and they can be the trailblazers that create a new normal. So I think there are many factors uh, that play into it, but I'm hopeful that uh, as 
as, as um, countries start to think about how they manage care as a whole, that this will play into their decision making. And that actually creates a demand for innovations that can do what the Coloscope does. I don't know that there are many, but I think that there is an opportunity for many. Yeah, thank you. That sounds like uh, really great. And I think this is going to like revolutionize the entire uh, way the industry is currently working. I hope so. I hope so. I think it's time. Um, and just to see my husband doing telemedicine as painful as it is, just to see him adopt, it's possible. It's possible. It's a very quiet audience. Thank you, Karthikeyan, for those great questions. Thanks, Nami. Questions are a great way for me to also assess how we're doing things. So don't be afraid to ask questions or no question is, you know, not worth asking. Nini, uh, this is Carrie Riedel. I have a question if no one else does. Uh, okay. I noticed that you, so you have specific locations like in Ghana, in India, in, um, in Central and South America that you have been working with. Um, how do you all go about kind of forging those global partnerships to work on this? And do you have gatekeepers? And I would be interested, this is, if, if there's time, if you kind of have to rethink your approach for different partnerships and, and how you kind of work those. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that honestly, it was organic. I wish I could tell you that it was a script. It was whoever would work with us. But over time, we realized that there were a set of criteria that we needed to embrace because um, how can we just continue to do that? Um, and certainly we wanted to touch the different continents and places where we thought cervical cancer was prevalent. And we also wanted to touch on different health systems and there are vastly different health systems depending on where you, in the world you are. And the third is um, cervical cancer guidelines also change depending on where you are. So I think that to truly test any kind of model in a new healthcare system, you have to test it um, in different settings. And as Marley Krieger in our center says, like the real proof in the pudding is when you take something that works one place and you see if it works somewhere else, right? That's the way to scale. And so uh, I will give her credit for a large part of the uh, relationships that were created. I, I certainly didn't do it entirely by myself. Some of it was done by my students who literally said, okay, you know, I'm from Ghana and I'm interested in seeing healthcare improve in that country. So that's how it was organic, but it was also, uh, a partly uh, fortuitous because of what it allowed us to do, which is pressure test our solutions in different places and also establish relationships and trust, which is going to be very important as we take the next stage or the, pursue the next phase, which is to implement all parts of our model in these various settings. And we have built these partnerships, which I think is incredibly important when you're trying to do something that isn't status quo. So. Um, it's all about people and relationships, right? Uh, technologies come and go, but people are, you know, the, 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 the thing that you have to think about. And so we focus on relationships and trust and uh, respecting people from different cultures as we um, work with them. That makes sense. Thank you. And I have to say that um, I just want to add that um, I wouldn't underestimate the power of young people. I mean, I can't include myself as part of that group, but I have to tell you over and over again how uh, students and, and, and staff in my team uh, are able to create connections that I could never do on my own. And I think that, um, you know, it takes community, but not the usual suspects of your partners, but it takes students and staff and, people who deeply care about the, the mission to multiply that in ways that I couldn't do on my own. So just wanted to add that. I love that, thank you. Um, do any of the young folks on the call have a question right now? I know that your time is really valuable. We do have this recording and I'm going to talk to IT about getting uh, <laughs> the offending part, part of the other recording um, cut off, and then and then we can hopefully provide both of those because I know that uh, Nabil and Alexandria wanted to provide those for people to use later on.
Great. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really help it. I'm, I really am grateful and I hope this is helpful to, to everyone thinking about um, health disparities and, and technology innovation. Thank you so much. This was, I found it incredibly interesting and I really appreciate your time and I know everybody on the call did too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Wow.